<laughs> Welcome to Horizon. Uh, if you know me personally, you know I'm a mess. So that's <laughs> We're getting started a little late today. We are so glad that you are joining us today. We're singing Christmas songs, songs that we've done before, just with a little bit of a fun beat. So get up, dance, praise the Lord that he has come. He stepped into our world to save us of our sins. And it's a glorious thing to praise him. Let's worship. <laughs> One, two, one, two, three, four.
God, just thank you so much for this church. I thank you so much for the people here in this community. And Lord, I just, I'm so grateful for this time where we can just pause, reflect, and just remember how great you are and how great your love is for us. Be with us today. Be with me as I speak as well, Lord God. I need your help. In Jesus' we pray. Amen. 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 Well, good morning. Welcome to Horizon Community Church. My name is Al Salvatore, and uh, I am just pleased to be able to have the opportunity to speak today. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Alex, for giving me the opportunity. And just shout out to Pastor Alex and Darby. Um, we just give these guys a round of applause. Um, seriously love you guys. And, um, you know, um, there's, I, I spent a lot of time in church. I um, spent a lot of time working in church. And one of the things that I really love about Alex is how he interacts with my boys. And you can tell a lot about someone by how they treat your kids. So Alex, thank you so much uh, for just uh, treating my boys like a friend. Like he's on, he's playing Fortnite with my like eight year old son on like video games. And it was so cool because like my son was playing video games and he was talking to one of his friends. He's like, yeah, I play, I, I play Fortnite with my pastor. And his friend's like, you play Fortnite with the pastor? What kind of Fortnite, like, what kind of pastor plays video games? He's like, my pastor does. And it's like, that's cool. I mean, it's, it's a little thing, but it's a big thing to him, and, and I, I really appreciate it. And, and it's cool. Uh, so we are continuing our series called The Once and Future King. 
And I've been loving this series, uh, just hearing from other speakers and teachers, and uh, it's just, I'm happy to ha- hop right in, into this message. Take a look at Jesus' life and how the Old Testament points to the New Testament and just the, all the connections, how this is one big book that points to Jesus. And I remember growing up in the 90s, there was a phrase, WWJD, and it like it went viral before going viral was a thing, right? I mean, and when it first started, it was like pretty cool. WWJD, what would Jesus do, right? You know, would, would he be loving? Would he be kind? And people wore bracelets, right? The WWJD bracelets. And it was almost like a way to be like, ooh, look, there's a Christian. Throw on a WWJD bracelet. You know, it was just kind of like this cool, like inside church thing. And then it kind of like took like a turn. And it became like this like judgmental phrase. Ooh, is that an R-rated movie? What would Jesus do? And I'm like, I don't know. Jesus didn't have movies back in the day, you know? And it became like this like judgmental thing and then it kind of like lost its its kind of flavor. But the intent of it was good. We should be thinking, what would Jesus do? We should be thinking, how would Jesus love? And in this passage. In Matthew, we're going to be taking a look at how our actions truly matter. It's not just what we say. It really is about what we do. Taking a look at another J, Joseph. So let's read this portion of scripture. It's a lot. We're going to read it. Um, But it's important to kind of get this um, picture of what was going on at this time after the wise men came to visit Jesus. And so let's take a look and see what it says in Matthew 2, 13 to, uh, it's, it's not 32, 23, my bad. See, even like a teacher, I still get the PowerPoints wrong. It's all right. Here we go. After they had gone, Joseph had another dream. The first dream was his dream that God told him not to divorce Mary. An angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Get up and now flee to Egypt. Take Mary and the little child and stay there until I tell you to leave. For Herod in time, intends to search for the child to kill him. So that very night he got up, took Jesus and his mother, and made their escape to Egypt. I mean, this seems like one of those like crazy, amazing like movies, like fleeing in the night, you know, music playing, and made there until Herod died. All this to fulfill what the Lord had spoken through his prophetic, uh, through his prof- spoken through his prophet, so through his prophet, I summoned my son out of Egypt. When Herod realized that, there had been, that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated. So he sent soldiers with orders to slaughter every baby boy two years old and younger in Bethlehem and throughout the surrounding countryside, based on the time frame he was given from, the, from interrogating the wise men. To fill the words of the prophet Jeremiah, I hear the screams of anguish, weeping and wailing in Ramah, Rachel is weeping uncontrollably for her children, and she refuses to be comforted because they are dead and gone. Tragic. It's amazing how so much just death surrounded Jesus' birth and controversy. And he even goes on to say this because they went out of the woods yet. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared to him again in a dream while he was still in Egypt, saying, Go back to the land of Israel and take the child and his mother with you. For those who sought to kill the child, are dead. All right? So Joseph's like, great, let's go back. But, so he woke to take Jesus and Mary and return to the land of Israel. But, he heard that Archelaus, Herod's son, had succeeded him, ruler of all the territory of Judah, and he was afraid to go back. We will find out why he was so afraid later on in this message, because Archelaus was even worse than his father. So, um, then he had another dream from God, warning him to avoid that region and instruct him instead to go to the province of Galilee. So he settled his family in the village of Nazareth, fulfilling the prophecy that he would be known as the branch. All right, so a lot going on there. Fleeing, leaving, kings that are just awful, and this family that is just constantly on the run. You just think about all that went through Mary and Joseph's life just to give birth to this son. They try to travel to this town. There's no place to, to, to stay. And then they, once they're all settled and the wise men come, they bring gifts. This is great. They got to leave again. They go to Egypt and then they got to go back. I mean, it's just very unsettled. Do you ever have one of those seasons in life where you just feel like you're just going from one thing to the next thing to the next thing? 
And just when you get settled, here comes another thing. And just when you feel like there's peace, oh, here's this other like situation. It's just like, oh, you just can't catch your breath. This whole verse, you just feel like this family has not been able to catch their breath. And this verse is full of Old Testament prophecy. Verse 14, Hosea 111, both Jesus and Israel came out of Egypt. Again, these were signs pointing that this child, Jesus, is special. Verse 18 points back to Jeremiah 31, 14. Rachel, mother of Israel, wept for her children. This was the Rachel who was not able to have kids. And she would cry at the, at, at the temple, pleading and praying for children. And this called back to what would happen when Herod killed all the other children. There was great weeping, like the weeping that Rachel had over children. And then there's another call back to the Old Testament. And this verse in Isaiah 11.1 1 is chock full of deep spiritual truths. We're going to break down in a minute. This victorious branch of Israel. That is a loaded, loaded statement. So let's take a look at what this term branch is all about. So branch, all right? Branch in Hebrew is where we get the term Nazareth. And Nazareth means heir of a powerful family, victorious one. I mean, so they're thinking that this person, this Messiah is gonna be this amazing, political, rich, powerful family. Jesus was powerful. His family did amazing things, but not in the way that they were thinking. It was more of an eternal one, not just a temporary one. And it was victorious. And that word Nazareth has the root word Nesser. And I love this. Keeper, watchman, guardian, keeper of secrets. It almost sounds like something from like Harry Potter, you know? Nazareth, the keeper of secrets, you know? Um, aren't you glad that Jesus is a keeper of secrets? I mean, to love someone is, is to cover their sin. And even back in the Old Testament, when Adam and Eve first sinned, what did Jesus, what did God do? He covered them. You know, we live in a culture that wants to expose people and cancel them, and Jesus wants to cover you. Those things you do, those thoughts you have, He keeps those secrets. He knows everything about you, and He still loves you. That is a king worth celebrating. And he's a watchman, he's a guardian, he looks over your life. And this just really is such a contrast to the other kings in this story, and we'll get to them in a second. And it goes on to say this about uh, this Nazareth, this branch. It's loaded. This, this idea of branches is all throughout the Old Testament, the tree of life, the set of branches of Israel, the lampstand, the vine. Um, and even this idea of this branch, the actual term branch in this context, in the Hebrew context, is a branch that is grafted in to another branch, that this branch has other branches grafted into it. Now, I never knew that you can graft branches and trees. I mean, in that culture, they were an agrarian society, agricultural society. They're all about planting and, and grafting, and, and their whole culture is based around farming. Um, our culture is probably based around like target pickup. You know, I pull up, Person comes out, drops off my groceries. This is pretty amazing, all right? This whole idea of grafting, this was so a part of their culture. And this idea of grafting was so a part of our American culture way back in the day. You can actually graft a tree, different trees, and get fruit. It's amazing, and it's something that we still do today. Check out this video. Grafting is one of the craziest things that we never talk about. Every single apple you've ever eaten in your entire life was grown like this because a Macintosh apple seed does not produce a Macintosh apple tree. And so what you have to do is you cut off branches from an apple tree and just stick them into another compatible tree. You can even use like a plum tree or, or a cherry tree and that other tree will literally grow off of it and, and produce apples. So every single Macintosh apple you've ever had actually came from the same plant in 1811 and we've just been cutting off branches and sticking into other trees ever since. A lot of information, but wow, one tree, so many fruit, one king, so many heirs. We're all grafted into that same branch of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? 
I mean, and so when, when, when they're talking and, and reading about this branch, they're having this in their minds. I never knew you can do that. I didn't know that Macintosh apples that we have today go back to this tree from 1811. I had no idea that the Savior that we have today has roots that go back thousands, thousands of years, even before then. That Christianity is not a new religion 2,000 years old. It has its roots all the way back in Judaism. It's amazing to think of. What an amazing king. What an amazing king that has allows others to be grafted in. And it's a stark, stark contrast to this earthly king of Jews, Herod the Great. With all those amazing qualities of Jesus and his branch that is a keeper of secrets and a guardian. And he was able to bring people together and be part of this bigger plan. Herod was king of the Jews. It was a title given by the Romans because Jerusalem was under Roman occupation, but he, he was not a good king. He rebuilt the temple, and he did this not because he wanted to honor like Jewish culture and their religion. He did it just to be liked. He didn't care about the religion. He wanted it just, just to be, to have favor, to get their votes and get their favor. And, you know, not like politicians ever do this today, say they're a part of some religion just to get people to vote for them. But, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, he built pagan temples in Israel, too. So, like, it, it, it totally diminishes the temple that he built for Israel if he's got all these other pagan temples as well. He's trying to please everyone. He was a surface king. He wasn't a deep king. And he ruled by fear, suspicion, and jealousy. This was someone who was constantly watching over his shoulder and was worried that someone was going to take his place. That's why he murdered over 40 boys in Judah. Bethlehem was a small town. Infant death rate was high. So according to tradition, it could have been close to over 40 boys that were killed that Herod killed. It wasn't this massive amount of boys. It was, could be between 40 to 100. All right. He also executed... 40 students and two rabbis that removed the Roman symbol. All right? And he also killed his own sons and wife. Herod the Great was not very great. It's pretty awful. And there's an Italian artist, Giuseppe Acromboldo, who painted this picture in 1556, where you look at it, it's kind of like cringy looking. But at a closer look, his face is made of all of babies. I mean, you can just take a look at it. And, and I, art can be provocative sometimes. And I kept looking at this, and it just paints a picture of how awful and cringy this king really was. But as bad as he was, his son was worse. Let's take a look at his life. There's a temple riot. And he killed 3,000 citizens, 3, citizens. So we go from this Herod the Great, and we hear this story about him killing all the boys. His son killed far more. 3,000 citizens. This caused them to cancel Passover. So he canceled this massive um, religious holiday. There was also a riot as it, at his inauguration, and he crucified 2,000 people. All right? And this was a public display, and so... Can you imagine after this person comes to power and you see all of these people hanging around you? This was a culture of fear and oppression. You can understand why the Jews wanted Jesus to be like this military figure that's going to rescue them when you walk out of your house and you see people hanging from trees. Now, he was so mad that the Jews and Samaritans wanted him to be removed. Okay, the Jews and Samaritans didn't get along at all. They hated each other, but they hated him more. And they wanted to work together to get rid of him. That'd be, that'd be like Republicans and Democrats working together to do something good. That's kind of like foreign in our culture. When do Republicans and Democrats ever do anything together, right? It's, it's, it, they hate each other. Samaritans and Jews hated each other just as much, but they were working together to get this guy out. And this is why Joseph was afraid to go back to Judah because this king was in charge. And he heard about all these atrocities that were going on. And it's amazing 
Because you see all these awful deeds that these kings did. These big displays, these grand gestures of just awful human behavior. And then you have Joseph, the father of Jesus, who does these amazing acts of faith and kindness that are just moving to me. And we're going to take a look at why. Because Joseph had four dreams, four significant dreams. And in these four, in, in these four dreams dealt with these four things. The first dream was to keep his engagement to Mary. All right, Mary became pregnant through the Holy Spirit, something completely unprecedented. So whose baby is it, you know? like, And in that culture, when your fiance gets pregnant, by his right, he could have had her killed. That was considered adultery. But he chose, I mean, even before the angel came to him, he chose to break off the engagement quietly. And then the angel came to him and said, no, 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 no. There's a bigger thing going on here. I know you want to do that quietly, but trust what's going on. And so, so there was the first dream, to stay engaged and to marry Mary. The second dream was to live in Egypt, to flee. The third dream was to return back to Israel. And then the fourth dream was to go to Galilee. So let's break these dreams down, because they are pretty, pretty significant. The first dream, the dream to keep the engagement. Joseph following through what the angel told him, he had to give up his reputation. To marry someone who was pregnant before they were married was scandalous. So for Joseph to marry Mary, he was risking his reputation too. He was willing to be identified with someone who was scandalous. And he didn't care. He loved her and he was trusting God. The second dream, the dream to flee to go to Egypt, he had to leave his family. He gave up his family. Joseph had a big family because that part in Jesus' life when they're going to the temple and they lose Jesus and they're like, where is Jesus? And Jesus is talking to the to the rabbis in the temple, and Mary questions him, like, how can you do this to us? Like, wh- like, why? like, why did you do this? And Jesus is like, wouldn't you think I'd be in my father's house? All right, so in that day, families traveled a lot together. They would caravan together, so it was not uncommon to get lost with your big family. He was probably with cousin James, you know? No big deal. Big family. Had to give it all up. Had to give all his family up. Also had to give up his security. Now, Israel was an agricultural society, and Joseph's trade was carpentry. And so to go to Egypt, this was actually a good thing for them financially. Egypt was a city. It was a city of commerce. All right, And if you had a trade, you were a successful businessman. And they had a thriving economy in Egypt. It was a privatized economy. So he just got all these gifts from the wise men. They had money. Here's Joseph starting a new business in Egypt. Joseph and Sons, you know? Like, this could be like a really great thing for him, thriving away from all of the scandal and wars and, and just just the ugly religious battles in Israel. He can go to Egypt, start a business. I'm good. This is great. All right? I can find my security in Egypt and have this business. And then angel comes again. Joseph, two years later, you got to go back. What? I just got comfortable here. My business is going really great. You want me to go back? I have to give this up? And he did. And the funny thing is, you don't even hear him say anything. He just he just goes. Angel speaks to him, he goes. And then he has to give up his home. He can't even go back to where he grew up because of King Herod, what's his name again? Archelaus. He just sounds bad, doesn't he? <laughs> All right? And so he had to give that, he had to give that up. You know what's amazing about all of these dreams and all of the things that Joseph did? He never complained. He never questioned God. In fact, in all of Scripture, you never hear anything about Joseph. You just learn about what he did. There's no recorded text of what Joseph said in the Bible. You only learn about Joseph through his character, through his quiet faith. 
Scripture never quotes the words of Joseph, only his quiet faith. And I love this picture. This is uh, a Dutch painting called Child of Christ by Garrick von Hornst from 1592, and he was a contemporary of Rembrandt. And I love this because you see Joseph working, and you see Jesus holding the candle, holding the light. Not even looking at what Joseph is doing, just looking right at his dad. We serve a God who just loves to look at us. We're so focused on what we're doing. And we serve a God who looks at us and is watching us and loves us. And I bet Jesus loved watching his father because he was a man of integrity. When Mary was pregnant, he didn't question God. What's the Bible say? That he married he married Mary. When the angel came and said, you got to leave to go to Egypt, he didn't question him. He packed up and left that night. He simply trusted God despite the difficulties. And it's amazing because throughout Scripture, we see people kind of have this like back and forth dialogue with God. Moses had it. David had it. Even in the New Testament, Ananias, who God told to go pray for Paul so he can receive his sight, he questioned God in Acts. You can read about it. He's like, God, do you know who this person is? This is the guy who's killing Christians. Yes, I've got a plan. So he says this dialogue and God convinces him. The angel never had to convince Joseph. He just simply trusted. And I, I just kept looking at this picture, and it's just amazing. And I, I want to end with this verse from James, the other brother of Jesus, because Joseph had sons and daughters. And James, the book of James, that's from James, that's from Jesus' brother. Which, if you think about it, can you imagine like being James, the brother of Jesus, <laughs> as a younger brother? That would stink. James, why can't you be more than of Jesus? Yeah, like Jesus never messes up, you know? Like Jesus never comes to late for curfew, and you know, Jesus never talks bad about his brothers and sisters, and you know, Jesus gets AIDS on all of his tests, like. James, why can't you be more like Jesus, you know? Like, man, was he like God or something? Yeah, you know? But I love, and the book of James is all about faith and action. That is the book. If you look at James, it's all about, don't tell me how great you are. Don't tell me how much you believe. How do you live? Why do you think James was so focused on the actions, that your actions match, matches what you believe? Because who was his father? Joseph, a man who was known for his actions. And I love this verse from James 1.12. If your faith remains strong, even while you're surrounded by life's difficulties, you will continue to experience untold blessings of God. I mean, can you imagine the stories that Joseph would tell his kids when they were on the run, traveling from this place to that place? Are these doing his carpentry work. I mean, his stories must have been like great television for his kids. Wow, you guys were on the run? You had an angel talk to you? Like, oh my, you lived in Egypt? What was that like? Like, you can just imagine the stories that you would have. True happiness comes as you pass the test with faith. Why does he say this? Because he saw his dad do it. And receive the victorious crown of life's promise to every lover of God. That victorious crown, that branch, guys, that's for us too. Anyone that loves God, you get grafted into that victorious branch. We become heirs and heiresses of the King as well. I want to encourage you, if you're going through a difficult season and it is hard to trust, God is doing more than you think he is. And you're probably doing better than you think you are. God loves you. He's got a plan for you. You know, for Joseph, it was fleeing and returning to Egypt and Israel. What's your situation this holiday season? What situation are you facing where, like, you want to complain? You want to have that, like, banter, that sparring match with God? What if, Maybe we just need to simply just trust him and let him work out every other detail like Joseph did. It's hard. It's not easy. 
but he's with you. He'll never leave you. And I'll be honest, I'm kind of going through it at work too. You know, this has probably been like my hardest week of work. I had a teacher observation and I failed it. And I have to do it again this week. It stinks when you don't do something the way you think you should do it or you want to do it. And it was a big time check in my pride. So I'd be like, how dare you question my, my teaching methods? I'm amazing, I'm a great teacher. Like, yeah, we still need to do this, this, and this, and this. And it's like, ooh. You know, and I can have that like desire to like go toe for toe and justify myself. I'm like, no, 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 need to be heard, you know? Joseph didn't need to be heard. He just did. And his life spoke volumes. May we be the same. May we have that quiet faith of Joseph. When we want to speak, may our actions say everything that we need to say. And may we trust God with the rest. And I guarantee, you know, things may not be the way we want them to be or look like the way we want them to look, but it doesn't mean that God's not moving. And it doesn't mean that we won't have the victory in the end. We are grafted into the victorious branch. You are not alone. We are not alone. And let's stand together victorious. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's stand. Let's pray. Team can come. God, I thank you for today. God, may we have a quiet faith. And may we live in love like Jesus and Joseph. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you, Rick. Uh, um, all right, y'all know this walk is going to be today.
Thank you. 